Hello everyone and welcome to Rad Chat, the first therapeutic Red Dog for Lead oncology podcast. Welcome to podcast number 45. My name is Naaman Joe Anderson and I'm joined by my fellow host Joe McNamara. Evening everyone. A big thank you to our last guest, Victoria Cuthill, who talked about genomics and her Macmillan Fellowship. If you haven't had a chance yet, please do go and take a listen. So we're very pleased to introduce our guest for this evening, Luke Dix, who will be discussing CERN and flash radiotherapy. Hi Luke. Good evening and uh, welcome from France. (laughs) <laughs> thank you for coming on like i'd say joe and i've been very excited about this one for a while so um so yeah do you want to tell us a bit about your current role and kind of how you got there luke okay so currently i'm sort of the most busy man in the world because i am writing my phd thesis uh so i'm doing a phd at the university of oxford and broadly when i applied for this phd i knew i wanted to work in the field that i'm working in but i just put i want to work abroad So I knew I wanted to work in accelerator physics, particle accelerator physics. So this is the sort of technology we use at CERN. So this is where we take elementary particles like electrons or protons, accelerate them to really high energies, and then basically smash them into things. And this turns out to have sort of a great sort of uh, crossover with what you're doing in, in, in radiology, because what you're doing is you're taking elementary particles you're accelerating them to a certain energy and then you're smashing them into things. Now, obviously, there's a slight difference that instead of big lead targets, you're, you're smashing them into tumours and, 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 and whatever, but it's broadly the same sort of field. And it's been really an exciting thing for me to do because I come at this from doing an undergraduate degree in theoretical physics and really focusing on maths and physics and how the universe works and then started to... At the start of my PhD was working on a, a project looking at uh, developing a machine to search the universe for dark matter, which is one of these things that has a really interesting name and is actually more interesting the more you know about it, because it turns out the sort of matter we can see, so this is the stars, the planets, nebula, uh, at you and us, uh, all of this forms a very small fraction of the universe. And... It turns out most of the universe is dark. We, we can't see it. And so what we're trying to do at CERN, one of the things we're trying to do is understand what this dark matter is. So I worked on this project, which was developing a, a particle accelerator that accelerates to quite a high energy, so a few giga electron volts. So this is a sort of a, a thousand uh, or a hundred thousand million times uh, higher than what you be using in radio, if radiotherapy. But it'd be sort of generating three and a half to 20 GeV beams, giga electron volts, and then looking for dark matter with that. Then uh, it turns out that a group at CERN were working on doing radiotherapy with very similar technology, which is where I come in because I was doing these simulations on what we uh, what we do at CERN on this dark matter experiment, and it turns out they needed exactly the same simulations for this new machine that they were developing. Does that mean you're essentially doing two PhDs in one, trying to solve all the problems? <laughs> well, it's it's sort of a bit like that, but you sort of uh, you have to notice that when the writing is on the wall at some point. So this project that I was working on was a really exciting project, but basically didn't have the money to be built. And so it sort of allowed me to have a PhD thesis that is a sort of mixed bag of ideas. But they have a broad central theme, which is that the simulations that I'm doing are, are quite similar throughout. At the same time as this, I've also done some experimental work, which has sort of more and more gone towards doing radiotherapy tests. So there's a facility that we have at CERN. So CERN, you will have heard of this, Will if you're into physics at all, which hopefully some of your listeners are. But CERN has a, the big machine, which is called the Large Hadron Collider. Now, this is a 27-kilometer long ring that accelerates protons to uh, several what are called terra electron volts. So this is a unit of energy. Basically, the beam has the same energy as the Flying Scotsman going at about 100 miles an hour. So it's a a lot of energy just to put in a few protons and smash them into each other. Now, I work on a much smaller machine called the the CERN Linear Electron Accelerator for Research, which is a really good acronym because it spells out the word CLEAR, which is rather good. But uh, we, we, we operate at just 200 MeV, so not too dissimilar to what you'd be using in radiotherapy. And we accelerate electron beams to this energy and then direct them into things. Now, 
The first sort of users of our machine were uh, space probes. So people from the European Space Agency came in. They wanted to test how well their uh, electronics could handle 200 MeV electrons. Put them in the end of our beam line. We shone our light, uh, our electrons on them. Saw if they braked or not. If they broke, uh, we fixed them and we, we tried to make them harder and more durable. If they didn't, we did uh, we did another test and uh, and see see if we could break them. Now, this sort of led away into doing uh, tests on what's called very high energy electron radiotherapy, which is where instead of using uh, photons or, or protons or ions, you use high energy electrons to do radiotherapy. And so there's sort of a few things that come around by this. So this was basically done as a way of using electrons to treat deep seated tumors. So you've got, currently got some low energy uh, radiotherapy linux for electrons but these can really only treat superficial tumors and, and mostly skin cancers whereas if you have higher energy electrons they penetrate deeper into the patient now the sort of dose profile you get in the, in, in the patient is is more uniform than say x-rays which sort of have a lot much more of their dose at the entrance to the patient and then that decays away it was actually you get this sort of flat profile you don't quite get the Bragg peak effect that you see with protons. So you can't target the doses as, as conformally as, as you can with protons. But you also don't get the problems that some proton beams have with, in terms of proton beams passing through heterogeneous matter. So if you've got this Bragg peak, it's very well-defined dose. But if you, uh, say, have a small pocket of air in the lungs or you breathe in and out, you can end up completely missing the tumor with your Bragg peak, which is obviously a disaster in terms of radiotherapy. So we did these tests at CERN and we showed experimentally that if you use electron beams, you could sort of sit between X-rays and protons in terms of being a much cheaper facility than protons to start with, but also give you better dose uniformity with depth than X-rays and give you less sort of uncertainty with your range uh, than protons. So it's potentially an interesting technology in itself. And that's what we've been doing experiments on. We've been testing putting inserts into tanks of water, essentially, measuring the dose as if through the depth in the water, sort of a good model of, uh, of uh, a human. The great thing about being a physicist is everything can be modeled as some sort of uniform sphere of water or something like that. So it's, that's really easy. Obviously, that's not quite how it works in the biological field, but we're sort of progressing that field on a bit. So, Luke, what does your day at CERN look like? Because I know at the moment, obviously, writing up your thesis, it's maybe a little bit different, but, um, and I know Naaman has had the privilege of going to CERN, but for us who've, who've never visited, what is it like? What do you, because everything you've said has just blown my mind. Um, and all I picture is lots of people walking around in lab coats next to really amazing pieces of kit. Let us know, what is it really like to work at CERN? Well, it's basically as you think, um, not quite the lab coats anymore. That's about sort of 30 years out of date. But you do just sort of wander around, ride bicycles next to the Large Hadron Collider sort of thing, which is rather it's just weird when you think about it. Or you'll be in the control room and you'll be pressing the button that controls the Large Hadron Collider. It's, it's rather exciting. Uh, what I do day to day is some, most of my time is done simulations. So I sit in my office on my computer taking an electron beam modeling it and then accelerating it to a higher energy and then firing it into something but doing all of this on my computer then about sort of 40 percent of my time is spent in the control room of our machine um taking these simulations and seeing if we can get them to work in real life and so actually controlling the electron beam in our accelerator and performing experiments and then obviously the other 10% or so of my time is installing these experiments, putting them in physical work of a spanner, which for me, someone who does theoretical physics, I mean, I did that because I hated doing experiments. Now I actually really like experiments and get my hands dirty and, uh, and that sort of thing. So it's a real, it's a real exciting time. Also, you probably spend 5% of your time having coffee with people. Obviously not so much over the last few years, but it's a really important, <laughs> it's a really important thing for physicists to do. It's that exchange of ideas that you have over coffee or a, glass of wine or, or a beer or something is actually how the field progresses because everything that's all of this informal uh, communication is where you can just bounce ideas off each other and if you say something stupid nobody really cares if you say something stupid in the control room and people spend 10 minutes working on it that can get a bit annoying 
But if you're just having a coffee, having something informal, it's fantastic. It's really interesting you say that because uh, obviously we do lots of collaborative work um, from a university perspective. We give students lots of opportunities to work learning with, from and about each other. But it is interesting how when you then progress maybe into your um, profession and you are working clinically and it is highly stressful and time pressures, it is really important to still have that time, that kind of coffee time to essentially just talk about things that are happening at how you can develop practice and service. So it's really interesting that you've said that. And obviously from the work you're doing, talking about kind of, oh, let's just try this is probably a bit more fundamental um, to maybe us going, oh, let's let's sign this dough sheet in a different protocol. <laughs> I, slightly different <laughs> I, I think you're entirely right though it is a really important part of the working process and I think sometimes some people don't understand it so some people will just work all the time and, and, and just fill in the forms and do whatever and they don't really get involved with the community but actually science is a collaborative thing it's a procedure that has to be done with other people and it's a discussion of ideas and I think at the same time this has been what's most difficult over the last couple of years because it has been very difficult to just knock on someone's door and say, oh, can we, I've got an idea. Can we go for a coffee? Or I've got an idea after work. Do you want to go for a drink or something? And it's that sort of thing we've really missed. And it's been really difficult to replicate that online virtually. I think, um, I know as Joe mentioned, so Shannon Johnson, one of our guests before, and I very lucky to come to CERN as part of a um, well, part of a STEM award. It was amazing. And yeah, that's where we got to meet. I think I've been asked to ask you a question by someone, not going to name them, but <laughs> when Angel and Demons was filmed, did you get to meet Tom Hanks? I wasn't here then, unfortunately. Uh... <laughs> I know CERN had to release a full-on press statement to say why Angels and Demons couldn't happen. So they they did a lot of their filming here and they actually did it in the tunnel. They slightly jazzed it all up. So there's that scene of them in the control room as they create the antimatter. It's not quite how it works. And the control room isn't overlooking the experiment. But they had to really distance themselves a bit. But it's all real. Like all of those photos are real. The actual collider, the, the detector there is, is the Atlas detector, which is fantastic. I mean, this is like the size of a cathedral. You go down there and you're sort of looking up at the whole thing and it's it's completely exciting. So they, they obviously used that because it was such a great looking thing. But then they sort of thought, well, maybe it's not that good looking. And But it is funny. I do enjoy that sort of thing. Because I'm, so, I'm not one of those physicists that gets, some physicists will get really annoyed. So they'll be like, oh, that doesn't even conserve angular momentum. And uh, it's really tedious physicists. Whereas actually, <laughs> you just want to, if you're in a film, you can just let things go. As long as it's not utterly stupid, it's fine. I'm sure lots of healthcare professionals listening will have the same thing where you'll watch someone, let's say for our diagnostic colleagues, take an x-ray and you're like, that would never happen. Or if there's something where, I don't know, they haven't put gloves on to do some sort of biological thing and you're just like, no, it's never going to happen. My fiancé absolutely hates it so I'm just there like, nah, that would never happen. So I completely understand the caveat there. It's where the doctors take all the x-rays or deliver the radiotherapy and you're like, no, they wouldn't do that. Yeah, well, they've got like an x-ray and they're holding it upside down. You're like, I'm not even a diagnostic radiographer, but I know that's wrong. <laughs> um, so Luke, you've touched on um, kind of the work around. So what is flash radiotherapy? Uh, and what does it stand for? It's another good acronym. It's not an acronym at all, unfortunately. <laughs> So it's actually just a word that they came up with. Um, and I should broadly explain what it means. Uh, so flash, what it is, is potentially basically a new way of doing radiotherapy. So very different to how it's currently done. So that instead of taking a, a radiotherapy course, a whole dose for the whole course of radiotherapy, it's split it into several fractions. What you're actually doing is delivering that in maybe one or two fractions. Now, these fractions have to be delivered really quickly as well. So you're potentially delivering over 10 gray in less than a tenth of a second. And this is a, this is a really potentially revolutionary, uh, well, I say revolutionary, maybe too exaggerating, but uh, it's potentially a really important technique to really widen the therapeutic window. Because what's been shown biologically and what's been shown in, in experiments in all sorts of animals and all sorts of tissue types is that 
there seems to be the same amount of tumor control as conventional radiotherapy, but over several fractions. But actually, you're, 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 you've got significantly more tissue sparing when you deliver these high doses at very high dose rates, or what's called ultra high dose rates. And it's, it's sort of a really exciting thing that was first seen in the 1960s uh, in healthy tissue. They first saw that if you deliver these doses at, at really high dose rates, ultra high dose rates, healthy tissues don't die as much as they would as if you just gave it over a few minutes. Now, they didn't do the tumor side of things then, so it was sort of a forgotten issue. And actually, they used it more as a tool to try and understand why radiotherapy was working at all, uh, because you, it allows you to look at some biological mechanisms that work on certain timescales. So if you've got something that works on a very long time scale, flash probably won't excite that mechanism. Because if you've got something that works on a sort of nanosecond timescale, it's still going to be excited. So you can sort of differentiate between what's going on in the cells. Uh, so as I said, this was looked at in the 1960s and sort of in the 70s and 80s, it was sort of slowly fading out of, uh, of interest. Then what happened in 2014 is a group at uh, the University Hospital in Lausanne or Chouve, uh, at, with, with collaboration from other people, had uh, decided to do a study on uh, some tumours in mice. And they looked at giving them over sort of 10 grade doses uh, in less than a tenth of a second. And so they gave these really, really short doses, really high, high, high dose in a short time. And what they saw was this, this amazing tissue sparing in healthy tissue, whilst not killing the, uh, the, the, the cancer any less. And that was really exciting. And so in the following years, we've sort of tried to expand this to as many sort of biological models as, pros as possible. So they've looked at, uh, obviously, mice. They've looked at the, the brains in mice, uh, which has shown that uh, juvenile mice brains don't sort of see as much damage when you, when you irradiate them with these flash uh, dose rates. Or these ultra high dose rates and they've done uh, lungs in mice skin on mice they've done uh, skin on pigs they've done uh, certain tumors on uh, on cats as well and even in the last few years they've done a, a human patient so this was a chap that had had uh, 110 courses of radiotherapy over several years for a, 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 a tumor on his uh, skin and they decided to give him this really short, uh, really high high dose, short dose time, flash uh, radiotherapy dose. And what it did was it, it, it didn't kill him, which is one, one thing. And it seemed to give him the same amount of sort of uh, tumor control as, 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 as normally without as many of these uh, normal tissue complications that we would see in conventional, what he'd seen 110 times in his conventional radiotherapy. So this was, this was really exciting. Now, the big thing at the moment is we're sort of still firing the dark. It's a bit like this search for dark matter that I discussed earlier, that we sort of know it exists. We can see it. it. We can see the effects of it. We can see that if we give doses in this way, we get this normal tissue spare, uh, sparing. But we don't fully understand why it is. Now, in the 1960s, what they were looking at was just the effect of oxygen. So they were thinking that you fire the dose in really quickly, the oxygen in the cell gets used up before it can uh, before it can be replenished, and you get this sort of temporary hypoxia, which then means the cell can't be damaged as much. Now that has been shown in recent data to be not fully supported. So there's still this effect. There is oxygen depletion. It is important, but we know it's not the only effect that's actually causing this uh, this normal tissue sparing. And still, it wouldn't really explain why the tumor cells are killed in the same way anyway. So there's lots of biological effects that are now being studied. And what I'm working on specifically is building machines that can test the biology, biology in a more sort of systematic way. So at the moment, we're using modified current clinical machines, and they can't really give you the full range of sort of dose characteristics. So this is total dose, this is dose time, this is how the total dose is split up. So most doses that are delivered to patients aren't one single drip that goes over for a tenth of a second. It's sort of a tenth of a second, but it's actually split into loads of micro bunches in, 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 inside the dose. And so all of these parameters make a sort of six, seven dimensional, uh, or say, say phase space, but that might be a bit technical. But uh, this sort of six dimensional sort of space where you've got, well, 
if you make the dose higher, you have to make the dose time shorter or something like that. And, and it's all really complicated at the moment. And what we need is a systematic study with new machines to look at the biology in detail. What would you need from the machine to be able to do something like that? So one of the main things we need... And you can get as technical as you want to. Yeah, so, so one of the main things we need to do is be able to give a dose, as high a dose as possible in a short amount of time. What well, the dose that goes to the patient is basically the number of um, particles, whether this be photons, electrons, protons, whatever. So to get the most um, number of particles through in the, uh, the shortest possible time, what you need is when you're generating these beams, you need as high what, current beams as possible. So this is current is charge per unit time. Going back to sort of GCSE physics, um, charge per unit time, so you need as high charge in a short amount of time. Now, this is actually quite hard to do because you can imagine smashing a load of protons in, into one bunch. They want to push themselves apart because they've all got the same charge. They want to spread out. So actually, you've got to control these beams in a certain way. So what we have to do is we have to be able to control the beams. We have to get higher beam currents. But at the same time, none of the current dissymmetry that works for radiotherapy has been shown to work for uh, flash yet. So you've got things like ion chambers. Uh, these don't give you a linear response as you increase dose rate. So at conventional dose rates, they give you this nice dose response and you, the, the radio, radiographer can see uh, what dose has been delivered to the patient and can be able to adjust the dose on a real-time basis. With flash, if you're giving it in a tenth of a second, these machines can't do that. So actually what we need to do is deliver, develop new dosimetry techniques. And this is where one of the things that we do comes in, which is actually taking some of the tools that we've developed for particle physics, say for detectors in the Large Hadron Collider, and looking to see whether we can use some of these. Because in the Large Hadron Collider, they have a few million events per second. So these detectors have to work at really high rates. And so actually some of this technology could be useful there. Also, we're looking at modifying some of these ionization chambers and other uh, current dissymmetry techniques. And at the same time, we're trying to do some some new things that are outside the two the two uh, the two fields there. Can I ask Luke, where does CERN get its money from? Is it largely through research? Because I'm just thinking, all of this sounds amazing, but everything costs so much money, doesn't it? In terms of being able to develop new products, um, does a lot of it come through research or? private um like benefactors so CERN specifically is a multinational organization uh, there's several members so it's the same so for those of you who don't know let's go back right to the start for those of you who don't know CERN is the european center for nuclear research this was a sort of idea developed in the 1950s where lots of leading scientists and government people in europe decided actually rather than trying to do this sort of nuclear physics race where everyone's trying to discover something new if we combine our efforts, we'll be able to find more results uh, in a quicker time and we'll be able to compete with, say, the United States, which is putting a lot more money in. And so it's actually a government-funded research lab, essentially. So there's 28 or something member states. I can't remember the exact numbers. It's separate to the EU, for example. So Ireland is not a member, but the UK is. Israel is a member. Um, various other countries have associate membership agreements. And... Everybody puts in a little bit of money and it adds up. The, the operating budget is over a billion francs a year. The amount of research that goes on flash radiotherapy at CERN is a very, very small fraction of that. So what we do is, is, is a, some work just using our beam parasitically. So the clear facility, for example, has its own research funding. Uh, the, one of the other projects I work on, which is the Compact Linear Collider, has donated some of its funding to flash research. So the Compact Linear Collider is one of the uh, replacements, possible replacements for the Large Hadron Collider. And this is uh, a potential electron machine. And as the name suggests, it's compact and linear. Compact in particle physics means it's only 20 kilometers long rather than 27, nice and short. And... Um, to make it compact. Does that mean you don't need a bike for that one? <laughs> oh, you will need a bike, but it's very, it's shorter than it should have been. Like if you just did it with, say, the conventional linear accelerator technology you use in your hospitals, it would be 150 kilometers longer. 
Um, so what it will do is it will operate uh, with accelerating gradients of sort of 10 times higher than these conventional Linux that you're using. So you've got these Linux, they accelerate sort of 10 MeV electrons, say, just as an example, in a, in a meter or two you know, on the gantry or whatever. Well, click could do that 10 MeV in 10 centimeters. It's it's an order of magnitude smaller. And so this is pretend, this is why they've involved themselves with flash, because they're actually looking at using high energy electron beams in a space that would be short enough to fit, say, on a gantry or in uh, in a hospital, just in just a room in the hospital, rather than the sort of size of, a, say, a proton machine, which would have to be the size of a small sort of sports hall complex or whatever. And, oh, sorry, I forgot what I was talking about there. But uh, no, so we were talking about funding, weren't we? So yes, so we've got some from, from CERN itself. There's also some private funding coming in. So some of the work we do at CERN is, to, is, is involving this uh, university hospital in Lausanne. And CERN has a collaboration with this university hospital uh, called DEFT, which I cannot remember. It's something like Deep Electron Flash Therapy. DEFT, it's a backronym. They're all backronyms. Ignore how bad the acronyms are. But this DEFT facility would be to build uh, a flash facility using high energy electron beams, but it would be building it at the university hospital in Lausanne. So they would try and do both the preclinical pre trials there, so the, the tests on on animals and other types of tests, I mean, even some of the dosimetry tests. And then hopefully they would be able to use the same machine to do or to move into doing human trials and potentially even further than that, even, even to a clinical basis. And so that's that's a private initiative that's been involved with this. So Luke, I have a dosimetrist colleague and they attended a flash conference and there was a poll at the end and they basically said, who do you think, you know, how many of you think Flash is a goer? You know, how many are going to put your hands in and go, yes, this is the next big, th big thing. And it was a 50-50 split. I don't, I'm sure maybe you heard about it or you were there. I was there. <laughs> why was it? Yeah. Why was it not? And oh, OK, then. Well, let's start. What did you go for? Yes or no? <laughs> so so I, I personally think. It will be used in the clinic, but we've got to be slightly cautious with what we, 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 how we egg it on, essentially, because we can't overhype it, because other types of technology for this sort of thing has been overhyped in the past, and it's come to nothing. So it's very important that we just keep our expectations as low as possible for now, but with the hope that in five, ten years, the, the, the field really moves on. So I, I voted yes, that it would be used in the clinic, because... Technology has been used before in radiotherapy that we've not really understood the mechanisms behind. And it's sort of been used because it works. And we already see that on these skin cancers, we should be able to treat them with existing technology. Flash. We do some human trials. We see that. The problem is, because we don't understand the biology fully, we don't understand bits of it, but we can't then extend that to all tumours. So you can't then say, well, it works on skin cancer. It will work on lung cancer. Or it works on whatever it work on the prostate. You can't do that at all. And actually, we've seen in, in some of the biological tests that we've done on mice that it doesn't work on all tumor types, or it doesn't at least give you the same effect, the same same order of magnitude effect. And so that is a really interesting thing in itself. And I think the important thing to remember with Flash is it sort of doesn't follow, it doesn't excite the sort of classical radiobiological response to radiotherapy. So it's, it doesn't work on the same sort of timescales, the same sort of effects. And that's what we don't understand. And that's why we need these machines to test it. If we have these machines, we have enough built over the next five, 10 years, then hopefully we can move it into the clinic. But it's not, it's not a panacea. It's not going to be able to be used for everything. It's not going to be able to use in every country in the world because, I mean, we have even poor typical radiotherapy, conventional radiotherapy uh, utility in, in many parts of the world. So it's going to be a slow burner. It might even be like what happened with, say, proton facilities in, in, in Europe, where it takes 20 years for them to be introduced in some places. And then 20 years later, that's where the first ones are being introduced on the NHS. It's a big, big, big field. It needs to be studied systematically before it enters the clinic. And do you envisage that that was why there was a 50-50 split? Or do you think there's anything else that maybe from an oncologist perspective, they're wary about kind of promoting the use of Flash or getting their name put behind it? 
Well, I certainly think there's a, there's, there'll be people that are wary because you make the mistake that kills someone. That's your name gone for good. And then that is a real possibility because you don't have any fallback. If you're giving a conventional radiotherapy dose and something goes wrong, normally it's not too much of a problem. I mean, it's obviously a big disaster. And there was that issue in the past where they had a software interlock rather than a hardware interlock and it didn't work. I can't remember the exact case. But that sort of thing is much harder to do with flash. So if you make a mistake early on, you make a mistake at this stage in the field, you just kill it dead. The whole field will go because it, that's just the reality of the world. And so I can really imagine why, why they're on that side. I think at the same time, it requires so much new technology that it's a big leap. Say, although proton radiotherapy was difficult, the accelerator technology existed and was already being used. People were using high current cyclotrons before radiotherapy uses. That was one of the first particle accelerators ever developed. I mean, they used to have one operating at CERN for 30, 40 years. Now with this flash radiotherapy, X-rays do work, so it's been shown in X-rays, but it's very hard to reduce, produce high flux X-rays, very hard to produce X-rays with high enough flux, in fact, because you're basically bombarding your tungsten or whatever with um, electrons, and at the end of the day, that target just gets too hot, and it's not a very efficient way of producing X-rays. Protons are difficult, because I said, because they're all the same charge, they want to push each other apart, it's very hard to get these high currents. At the same time, we don't know whether the Bragg peak works in flash. All tests of flash radiotherapy with protons have been shoot through. So you're not even getting the advantage of the, the, the Bragg peak. So it actually might not produce any advantage at all. So you might be using proton beams without the Bragg peak. So you're losing the Bragg peak advantage, but you're gaining something on flash. So you might actually sort of be in a nil sum game, but with a much more complicated and difficult machine, which obviously would then mean it wouldn't be in the clinic. Then there's the stuff that I'm working on, which is VHE. Well, there's not an operational VHE machine in the world. So to do to do use VHE, which I think is personally the, the most promising technology or the easiest to produce the, the sort of beams we would need for flash, but it's it's they don't exist. And to even get them to a clinical stage, you need to prove that they work and they work robustly and that they can perform radiotherapy at the same level as a typical machine. And you have to go through all those legal hurdles that make everything slightly more difficult, but obviously are there for a reason and there for safety and are there to make sure you don't make any mistakes. And at the same time, giving a 30, 40 grade dose to a patient, it's not going to do nothing. So although it seems to produce these normal tissue sparing, we don't know what the long-term effects are. We don't know how all of this sort of stuff, this is a real worry for some people in the radiobiological uh, area that they really don't understand how giving loads of dose to a patient doesn't kill them. And that's a, obviously a very big thing. Yeah, huge thing, quite important for our field, I would say. I think some of the radiobiology side of it is really interesting because I think you mentioned about the therapeutic window, if anyone doesn't know what that is, we say it's around six hours and that's when after you've had a dose of radiation the cells are the normal cells are healing or the cancer cells are being killed off but if that could change and if it was shorter you know that you could accelerate as you said apart from giving a high dose in one sitting you could do so we do hyperfractionation obviously already with conventional radiotherapy but if that was a little bit of dose to a big tumor you know maybe three four times a day for example joe and i've talked about radiotherapy centers in the world that have patients in as inpatients for the whole stay Obviously, in the NHS is a bit more difficult because you're always fighting for a bed for some something. But these sort of things, you could really personalise radiotherapy if, you know, say if it was for a specific tumour in the future where, you know, you wouldn't have to have six weeks of radiotherapy, it'd just be one day, two days. Yeah. And it, it would be amazing. But as you said, be careful, 50-50 at the minute. <laughs> and at the same time, you, if you were giving the dose in a tenth of a second, that's within somebody holding their breath. It's not that sort of two, three minutes where somebody can't do that it's there's those sorts of things that it also makes slightly easier um, i was gonna say as well it, it does it does go hand in hand doesn't it with improving imaging so you know for us we would rely heavily on ct actually we would have to have the mri infrastructure if you were going to be able to target that dose 
Um, that obviously then has workforce implications and training needs. So yeah, I can already, it's so exciting just that there are advances in this field. Um, but absolutely, it's all about infrastructure and making sure that you have um, the knowledge, expertise and processes in place, isn't it? And we saw that with proton therapy um, and that was slow and steady. And I think even now the protocols are still being developed year on year um, in response to kind of patient feedback and also um, the workforce and the work that they're doing there. Yeah, there's still a lot of open questions in this field. I mean, we don't really know how to do things with like on a gantry we don't have to do flash on a gantry we don't know if we can do scanning of beams don't know any of this so this sort of stuff's really hard so the, the project i work on depth we're not trying to use a gantry at all we just have three separate beam lines that would interact at three different energies and you'd be able to, to do some rotation or some equivalent of rotation around the tumor but you wouldn't be able to target it as effectively as um as a as a as, a, as an x-ray beam on, on a gantry or a proton beam on a gantry and so you need to be doing these treatment plans at the same time as what I'm doing with the, the technology and actually showing that this is worthwhile because it might produce a tissue sparing effect. But if you're not hitting as much, if you're not targeting it as precisely on the tumour, you're still doing a lot of damage. So it's lots of open questions. That's why it's exciting. Some... It is very exciting. Sorry, I cut you off. Um, I was just going to say, I think what you touched on around like obviously being very physicsy gantry design so multi-leaf collimators that's how we profile the beam if you want because no tumor is going to be completely uniform all the way around but i think from what i read is as i think exactly you said earlier that one pulse of flash should be too short for the the multi-leaf collimators to move in time i mean they're quite quick anyway but you know when we do volume volumetric arc therapy so vmat but for this it'd be too slow so you'd need like a multi mechanical gantry movement but the one thing i learned i think when we came to CERN, i can't remember who spoke to be honest um someone very wise but they said that lots of experiments at CERN, it's not about the end point because actually the things you find along the way that could really help develop anything that's exactly like this that fine flash may not be fully functioning for radiotherapy in the future but all the technology on the way i mean looking at beam profiling to symmetry it, it's amazing because it would really change how we would look at things I think protons, as Joe said, some of the side effect stuff, we have no idea what it's going to do. Um, and actually some of the skin reactions we see from protons is a lot worse than conventional radiotherapy. So it's constantly learning. But I think, yeah, it, it's a very, very nerdy podcast. And I love it. It's great. At the, at the same time as well, it's not just technological advances. It could allow you to, the biologists, to understand what's going on at a cellular level a lot more effectively. Say, there are weird things like um, one of the possible mechanisms to do with flash is the way that it doesn't seem uh, to affect the sort of gene expression in the same way that it would in, uh, in, a, in a regular cell. That's something that's unexpected. There's different production of, uh, of uh, hydrogen peroxide in cells with flash. There's a lower production of hydrogen peroxide in, in flash radiotherapy cells than in conventional radiotherapy cells. Why is that? Why is that causing a difference between tumor response and normal tissue response? So all these sorts of things will go on and all these various biological effects that are different at different timescales. And actually by using a flash or at least doing a study in flash, you'll get a better understanding of what's going on. So hopefully, even if flash doesn't become a field, doesn't become a therapeutic uh, tool, then there'll be something gained from it anyway. I've got an important question to ask, but just for anyone else listening, why is hydrogen peroxide important? Well, I would probably defer to you on that so much, but uh, I believe it's because it, it would do damage to the cells. So just, you, you've put me on the spot there. This is something where I have a biologist come in and she says, yeah, there's different hydrogen peroxide rates. I'm like, oh, that's exciting. And then don't really follow it up with it. Uh, so Joe, he said she, so I have to ask you on this question now. <laughs> so yeah, essentially any cellular um, changes have the potential then to change all of the cellular respiration, the cellular mechanics. So any change in any of those levels potentially could destroy a cell. So you are looking for that disruption. Um, and obviously dependent on any of those chemicals within the cell have the potential to then disrupt it. And if you get any of the organelles that are breaking as part of that mechanism, that in turn as well can kill the cell. So 
that's ideally what we are wanting to do. There are obviously direct and indirect action yeah. um, of 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 the photons and so obviously from that perspective as well it would be ideal to be able to hit the dna um, but that isn't the only way to kill a cell you can kill a cell by causing lots of disruption um, to its functionality so that's where the biology comes into it and that, which again is 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 basically for another podcast isn't it Luke? yeah exactly i mean <laughs> one thing we do we do think is that the dna damage the direct dna damage is similar for both those regimes and that would be something that makes a bit more sense because if you've got proton hitting a bit of DNA, ionizing it, whatever, that's not going to change with dose rates so much. Whereas the production of these chemicals is probably some potentially biological process, some immune response, whatever. That could be something that's important, but we don't think the DNA damage is, is different. I mean, I've done a test where we looked at um, a very basic test going back sort of 40 years in conventional radiotherapy. We just look at plasmid DNA, different dose rates. We don't see much of a difference at all. And that, that's something that needs to be shown. I mean, that, this sort of thing was done years ago. I mean, we, uh, one of my colleagues has been in the field for sort of 40 or 50 years, I can't remember. And she, uh, she was like, yeah, we used to do this in the early uh, late 70s, early 80s. And we were like, oh, okay. So that was quite exciting in itself. Uh, thank you, Luke. So important question. What does Rad Chat have to do to come to CERN? And can we come and visit and see flash radiotherapy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I might not be here for that long, much longer, but uh, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, definitely, I would get in contact with somebody and um, certainly with this deaf collaboration, they're really interested in, in bigging it up. And uh, when there's a bit, a few more sort of uh, pillars built for that, they'll certainly be open for, for visitors, especially people who want to publicise the, 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 the field of flash radiotherapy. I want to do a podcast on a bike, Luke, while cycling around. <laughs> we have to come at a very specific time of the year for that. So at the moment, the LHC is running. So it runs for sort of eight months a year. It closes for the, a bit of the summer and it closes for Christmas. It closes for Christmas because the French and the Swiss electricity people don't want it to use all the electricity over the winter period when everyone's at home making coffee or croissants or something and um they were all watching television and at home with the lights on or whatever so we, we'd shut down and that's when it's safe to go in because the activation the radiation is much lower but it's not like not quite like a uh radiological machine like a like a radiotherapy lunac the radiation levels could be really really deadly um and really high i mean there was a a story that uh, the uh Actually, I probably shouldn't tell that one. But there was very high doses at various times. But it was sort of, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's not get into that. Let's move on slightly. <laughs> so, Joe, basically, we're going to CERN for Christmas and Tom Hanks is going to ride a bike around the uh, collider <laughs> with us. <laughs> While Luke's Absolutely. obviously there too. <laughs> um, so, Luke, to come towards the end of the podcast, um, what are some of the top tips you would give to people? So, in anything related to this or your field or maybe your experience through the work that you've been doing? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, I had no idea that I would be doing this when I started my PhD nearly four years ago, uh, three and a half years ago, keep track of time. But I, I really had no idea that I would be doing this. I knew I would be, I had a very loose project defined, which was working on electron beams. Okay, very broad. I had no idea that I was getting in radiotherapy. What I basically did was two things, which was try and do interesting work and work that is challenging. And also don't be worried or put off by anything like, or oh, it's biology or it's doing something like that. I mean, it's very different to what I'd done. So I just basically jumped in the deep end and said, oh, this is quite interesting. This is a field that's in its infancy. It's moving quite a lot. I could make quite a bit of an impact on this field. That's very exciting for me. So that would be my first tip. Absolutely. Just sort of try new things, get yourself out there, put yourself in interesting situations and then sort of see what happens. Now, as well as that, I would also say on, on the flash side, stay interested, but slightly be cautious and don't get too carried away with some of the results that some people will tell you. And I think this is a generally useful tip in, in science. I think sometimes we get in a lot of trouble because we overhype our results and somebody will produce the press release. And often it's the scientists themselves writing the press release and they'll put in this means this. That will then be put in some newspapers, X, Y, Z. I mean, this must be a particular issue for you two. I mean, 
there's all, because cancer is such a, a media frenzied issue. I mean, you, you do any study that says we've done this to cancer or this causes cancer or this doesn't cause cancer or this helps to cure cancer, you really immediately got a media storm. So you have to just be careful not to overhype results. That's certainly one thing. I think the other thing is to brace and um, embrace uncertainty. If you don't know something, it's quite exciting. You can actually work at it and be sort of trying to find it. And that's much more exciting than knowing something, how it works exactly, and just sort of sitting there operating it. Really try and get yourself into the deep end and, and, and do interesting things. That's a bit generic, but that's what I think. No, thank you. That's brilliant advice for kind of anyone listening, really. Um, if they're still awake after all that physics chat, obviously. But <laughs> um, thank you to everyone for listening to Rad Chat. So your hosts today have been uh, me, Naomi Joe Granderson, and Joe McNamara. The huge thank you again to our guest, Luke Dix. Um, head over to our YouTube page to see a live recording of this podcast. Uh, if you're utilising the podcast for CPD purposes, consider the reflective questions posted along with any links to resources and literature that we've discussed. To receive your accredited CPT certificate, please complete the Google Form link with the podcast. Um, so our next guest to feature will be Stephen Tao, uh, who will be discussing Leo Cancer Care and their amazing projects. Um, so thank you for listening and goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>